Welcome back to Cell Biology class, everyone. So we are talking about how proteins are being created, the process of translation. We've just talked about making that initiation complex with the mRNA and the tRNA and the ribosome all together. So we've got it all set up at this stage. We have our first amino acid, um, methionine or FMET, depending on if we're talking about bacteria or eukaryotes. And now we're going to go through three steps in a cycle to add each of our additional amino acids for the rest of that protein. So we've initiated, we finished our initiation, um, we're ready to make our polypeptide chain. And amino acids will be added one at a time and through these three steps that are being repeated. So first, an amino acid tRNA will come to the ribosome. It brings its new amino acid here, and it's going to come um, and allow that amino acid to be joined to the peptide chain. The peptide bond formation will link these two amino acids together, and then the mRNA is going to move down through the ribosome and allow the next codon to be read to have the next amino acid come in, repeating that cycle through the entire protein. So when elongation begins, the start codon is here next to the P site, um, and the next codon is here at the A site. So elongation is going to start with this next tRNA with the anticodon that matches the second codon coming into the A site. This takes two elongation factors. So we're going to use some elongation factors to allow elongation to occur. This is EFTU and EFTS. It's also going to require GTP hydrolysis. Every incoming amino acid tRNA is going to bind into the A site. The EFTU complex is going to help bring in the amino acid tRNA into the A site. And when the amino acid tRNA is transferred here into the ribosome, we hydrolyze, we hydrolyze GTP and release the EFTU. Then EFTS will come and regenerate that GTP so that you have a new GTP to bring in the next amino acid. These elongation factors, EFTU and EFTS, are not specific for particular anticodons. So they'll bring all the types of tRNA, except for that initiator tRNA. They'll bring all types of tRNAs into the A site. Um, and so any kind of tRNA can randomly be coming in here. But only the tRNAs that are complementary to that codon are going to be stable and stay there in the ribosome long enough to allow GTP hydrolysis to occur. So the error rate at translation is less than 1 in 10,000 because of the interactions between the codon and the anticodon. The peptide bond will form between the amino acid that's here in the A site and the amino acid that's in the P site. And the growing peptide chain is going to be transferred to the tRNA in the A site. So both of these amino acids now are connected to the tRNA in the A site. It doesn't take any ATP or GTP hydrolysis to allow this step to happen. For a long time, we thought there was an enzyme called peptidyl transferase that catalyzes peptide bond formation, but there's not actually any such enzyme that does this. In bacteria, it is the 23S rRNA that actually catalyzes this. So our ribosomal RNA is able to catalyze this reaction. So that is a type of a ribozyme, an enzyme that's made of RNA. As that peptide bond is being formed, the mRNA is going to scooch on down into the next um, codon. So you have another codon being brought into the A site. During this translocation, the peptidyl tRNA is going to move from the A site to the P site. And this empty tRNA is going to move from the P site into the E site. 
and it is going to take another elongation factor, EFG, and this is going to be bound to GTP. The GTP will be hydrolyzed, and that is what provides the energy for the conformational change to move the, the tRNAs down into the next site. The cell is going to really make as efficient use of that mRNA as it can. If you remember, the mRNA is not a permanent part of that cell, so it's only going to be there for minutes, hours, maybe days, and so we are going to use it as much as we can during that time. So we will have lots of ribosomes down to it, bound to it um, here in the cartoon, but you can even see in this micrograph all of these ribosomes bound to this mRNA growing proteins off of them. This is called a polyribosome or a polysome, and that allows us to have maximum efficiency of creating proteins that we need when we need them. So we're going through the cycle of adding our amino acids. Eventually, a stop codon is going to appear and show up in the A site. Um, in our cells, that would be UAG, UAA, or UGA. When a stop codon appears, there's not a tRNA that's going to bind there. Instead, a release factor is going to bind. So this release factor comes in, and this release factor has special regions that are able to bind to that codon. The shape of that release factor is pretty similar to a tRNA. So this is called molecular mimicry. And because it's similar to that shape, it's able to fit into that A site. And once it binds into the A site, it hydrolyzes a GTP and releases that polypeptide so it can go be folded into its three-dimensional functional shape. And all of these subunits are going to come apart, the ribosome, mRNA, the tRNA, and they can be reused. The mRNA can continue to be read. Ribosomes can go impact translation in another mRNA. The tRNA can go find some more amino acids to bring to a new protein. But this polypeptide is now ready to be folded up. Uh, this polypeptide is ready to be folded up and become a functional protein. So to be functional, it does have to get its correct three-dimensional shape. If you remember in biology, we talk a lot about structure leads to function. And if you don't have the right shape, you're not going to get the right function. A lot of times to get the right shape, the protein folding is going to be using these um, proteins called chaperones. Um, molecular chaperones sometimes will be used multiple in sequence to get the fully correct shape of the protein at the end. And these can start interacting with the polypeptide um, when it starts emerging from the ribosome. One important function of polypept one important function of molecular chaperones is to bind to those polypeptides during the early stages of folding. That stops them from binding to other polypeptides and forming big aggregate clumps in the cell. If the cell starts folding the proteins incorrectly, chaperones can sometimes come get the incorrectly folded proteins and rearrange them so that they're properly folded. Otherwise, those improperly folded proteins are going to need to be destroyed so that you don't end up with these big aggregates inside the cell and between the cells that can lead to disease. In most proteins that are going to exist in a cytosol, when they're mature and fun fully functionally folded, their hydrophobic regions are buried in the interior of them. Um, but in this polypeptide, before it's folded up, those hydrophobic regions are exposed to the aqueous environment. And that's what causes them to aggregate. So chaperone proteins are able to identify those hydrophobic regions and they can repair those misfolded proteins and fix them in, in an ATP-dependent manner. Some of the most widely occurring chaperone families are HSP70 and HSP60. Here you have HSP70 proteins um, interacting with this polypeptide as it's being formed. So here is the HSP60 complex. Um, it's the GROW-EL, GROW-ES complex in bacteria. You have a partially folded 
protein or a misfolded protein that enters one end of the complex. And the GROW-ES subunit is going to attach to the open end and ATP hydrolysis will lead to a shape change in that GROW-EL subunit. That creates an hy a hydrophilic environment that's going to be um, make it easy for the correct folding of that protein to occur. And then the correctly folded protein is released and the GROW-ES subunit attaches to the opposite end. All right, we just have a little bit more to talk about in our discussion of translation. I'll see you for our next video. Bye.